So Workbench Projects primarily is a maker space, uh, tinkering space. I know somebody has visited my space. I see a familiar face. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's a place that allows people to walk in with ideas and literally walk out with prototypes. So the way we work is uh, we're an open, publicly accessible space in a metro station in Bangalore. So a lot of times people have walked in to actually buy metro tickets and then suddenly look at 3D printing or laser cutting or electronics, robotics, or even carpentry, and they go like, this is not the metro, but I'm in the metro. Right? So it sort of creates that very interesting. So when we created our space there, it was about being responsible from the get-go. So that meant creating a space out of a public space that generally people do not associate for a productive space. I generally, if you look at metros, they're like chai points or your coffee days or your pizza huts. But then you'd never really understand that a metro can also be re repurposed to a practical use one could sort of really go through. So that's where we sort of work. And our sort of graphic here literally sort of says who we are. So there's every kind of maker that could walk in and then has something or the other to do with the space. So again, there's another infographic which has certain text on it. It's too small, I know. But then if you can go to our website, you can see it in a larger format. So this is exactly how we were. We repurposed a metro station. And then that's where we plugged in a maker space. So literally, people sort of walk in, walk out, and then have a flavor of technology and innovation in a very democratic way. So this is the sort of insides of how it looks like. There's, a, there's been some modification. This is quite an old photo. But these are some of the work that we do as a company, as Workbench Projects, in that makerspace. So the makerspace sort of renders itself as a hub for even my own employees to leverage and work out of. So largely, the work that we do, the community that we attract is what becomes the backbone of the entire makerspace because you have people from diverse backgrounds and diverse interests that come and make it very exciting for the space. So that's where we can do all of this and more while still remaining a 10-person company, which is quite nimble and agile. So if you look at sort of what we've been doing, so there are Again, this is metrics as of last year. We have to revamp these metrics this year. But you can see us working in various sectors, sort of touching people's lives, and then really adding value somewhere or the other. It could be governments. It could be startups. It could be colleges. It could be schools. It could be communities and various other things. So our journey has been quite interesting over time. We started out of a garage, my co-founder's dad's garage, outskirts of Bangalore. And we had a lot of people who came just because the makerspace term was quite new. And then there was 3D printing, there was carpentry, there was a bunch of other things that people wanted a flavor of. And when we started in the garage, we had a lot of people who came on the weekends because it was outskirts of Bangalore. And the only crib of everybody was it takes two hours to get there. It takes two hours to get back. And even if you want to spend, let's say, three, four hours, it's time up. right? So you lost an entire day almost in transit. So that's where the entire issue was. And they were constantly asking, can we not be more centrally located? That's when we thought of repurposing a metro station to be that, because we had worked with BMRCL in many ways. So apart from this, you can also see uh, this is, again, part of a, our brochure, which I'm happy to share with Ashish if you're interested to take a look, of a, look, look into our journey. We've worked with many corporates, IBM, Intel. We've worked with Cisco. We've worked with Honeywell. We work with all of these agencies at the top end, identifying problem statements and sort of uh, issues that they need solved. But then their corporate processes are quite heavy. And it's not very easy for them to try new things. So that's where we come into the picture, engage startups. We sort of become like a facilitator to find the right fit 
the right fit for people, the right fit for resources, the right fit for talent to solve those problems. And you might have seen some of those flavors as hackathons, as product design sort of workshops or many of these things. So that's where we sort of engage with many different stakeholders to add value in some way or the other. Now if you really look at something that is at the core of everything is the why. Why does anybody do what they want to do? So that's where today's talk is largely going to be about some of those kind of areas that we are going to explore from at least our lens that we've been seeing, why would a student come to us? Why would a college come to us? Why would a company come to us? So how do you really justify the why part of things? Because everybody knows how, right? Tech is at the core of many of these solutions. But then that's not the easy answer, uh, or that is the easy answer. The e hard part is the why. Why do we have to do what we do? Now, if you really go back to where this all starts, today we are at the cusp of something called as the fourth industrial revolution. Because there has been some of these that has come before our time that has changed the way we look at things today. I don't think you can roll back to the era where steam engines or steam-based work is still there. You've moved on from there. Then came electricity, which could be powered by steam, but then Everything is not powered by steam. Today, it's powered by electricity. And again, now, you've moved to an era where everything is not just powered by electricity, but it's powered by connectivity as well. Everything is connected to everything. Now, if you're moving to a world which is sort of looking in that direction, if you especially look at this new term called as biophysical, right? You're looking at a point in time where there would be singularity. Singularity is achieved when man, machine combine. Now, man, machine, and the digital, when they combine, it's almost biophysical, because bio biological, physical, and digital. And if you look at spaces that are being developed, including your universities, and including the research focus, including the sort of sectors that you're all asked to sort of work in, being multidisciplinary in nature, working on many, many things, you'll almost fall into an intersection of something like this. And again, there's a lot of focus on today, something called the STEAM, which is science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. So where art, liberal, and humanity is becoming a part of science, technology, and engineering. Because everybody understands that you cannot have those sort of subjects as dry as they come. And if you look at some of these sort of trending stories across the world, right? Be it from your latest technologies of AR, VR, or 3D printing, or any of these, they all go through a cycle. They all go through a cycle where you will feel that, you know, sometimes you're hitting those high notes and that's why it's trending and you want to have a piece of it and sometimes it's already gone and it's part of history. So that's where we have sort of some of these graphs. Again, I know it's not visible, but if you want more of this information, you can find it in the brochure. But again, moving on, if you look at some of the success stories that we were able to sort of champion at our space, these are some of the tangible physical products that we have released into the market over the past three years of our existence it, at that metro station. The first one is an architect who just walked into workbench projects one day and then underwent a 3D printing workshop. And the guy had an idea to build a tidal wave energy harvester. What does that mean? It converts tidal energy to electrical energy. So the architect had no clue about what it takes to actually build this device. So he underwent a series of skilling workshops. He underwent a series of training sessions that ultimately helped him to design the entire system that today sits in Pondicherry and powering a cold storage unit there. And now he's going to fundraise for making it into a bigger product. Then there was a, of course, IoT is a very big terminology that's traveling just like the buzzwords that we were talking about. This is one of the devices that controls all the appliances in a particular room based on RF, and your other sort of uh, connecti uh, connectivity uh, channels. 
And if you look at this person, Paul de Souza was one of the guys who was building a braille device just like a Kindle for people with visual impairedness. So what Paul de Souza did was he built a device that was acting like a Kindle that could help people with visual impairedness read books from paragraphs to pages to zoom in on a particular word, check for the meaning in the dictionary, all on that device and all on Braille. So imagine if somebody is working on this, the amount of resources and connects needed is immense. So we connected him to the CSR efforts of one of the big companies here in Delhi, actually. And they funded his entire research to actually build this device, and now it is being deployed for people with visual impairedness. So this is another success story. And then there has been a lot of work that has happened since then. Another program that we work with, some of the rural Indian, uh, rural Karnataka-based uh, teachers is about Fab Educators program, where we take them and house them for 15 days in Bangalore, where they come through the channels that we already work with, with local education offices, with our local education departments. And they come through a program to undergo entire sort of skilling in digital fabrication. So one of the very interesting stories was from Ashok, very apt for Ashoka University probably, but Ashok came with a problem statement where he is a theater practitioner and needs power cans. You know what power cans are? Those spotlights that come. And those are quite expensive to buy if you are from a government salaried arts education teacher from Gulbarga, right? It's a very remote part of Karnataka. Now, if you look at it, if Ashok had this dream of having his children participate in making artwork or theater masterpieces, and you needed lighting equipment to make their performance nicer, and you had no budget, what do you do? So he came with the problem statement that he wanted to build a bunch of these using LEDs. Because you have a bunch of LEDs today that are powerful enough for a small theater performance that you could use. So he hand-soldered a bunch of these them, programmed them on an Arduino, and now he has a few of them powering it in his school for his students to perform. So that's one of the stories. Pragna was again, a music teacher who taught music in a very remote school. She wanted to teach children tempo, beats, and to stay on cue. So she built a metronome for herself by, by her whole, own hand soldering the uh, elements and other things that we bought for this. So similarly, each one of them underwent training in various technologies to solve problems that were haunting them, to make it very contextual, to make it very relevant as a space. So the space, anybody can create a space, right? All you need is money, right? Because Google will tell you what to buy, where to buy, how much to negotiate for. But what do you really do with the space? Who can benefit from that space? Who really can do something with it that it makes the space and themselves relevant, and those ideas as well. Another such program that we did was called as Enable Makeathon. Now, largely you might have seen, hackathons are two days, maximum three days. Like, you know, it's like a honeymoon effect. You come there for three nights, you're jamming with your buddies, and then you're sort of creating things, more nonsense than work, and then you're doing something at the end of the day to showcase what you've done. After that, what? Yes, somebody wins a prize, somebody sort of gets certificates. What next? What happens to that idea if it was really interesting? What happened to that idea? The idea sort of really takes a nosedive. So Enable Makeathon was to challenge the way hackathons were run. So we wrote a proposal to International Committee of the Red Cross in Geneva saying that, they're sitting on a gold mine of data for people with disability, especially refugee camps. You're talking about uh, war-torn areas. You're talking about natural calamity and disaster areas. All of these things where there is tremendous amount of support needed. Somebody might have lost a limb, a digit, or a family member, or whatever it may be. 
So how do you really solve problems for these kind of people? So how does a makerspace render itself to solve these kind of problems? Yes, we are sitting in India, Bangalore, right in the middle of no problems, no conflict area, technically, so to speak, there is conflict all around. But how do you really empathize and build? So that is where we are looking at a challenge like this was created with the Red Cross, with funding from them, saying that can we look at building or fast-tracking innovation for assistive technologies. So that is where you will see, like, you know, this was a 60-day effort. So it's almost, it's an automatic natural selection process where people who are only there for glamour and sort of just for the fun of a hackathon are removed because 60 days is a lot of time for somebody to commit. Won't you say so? Yeah? Is 60 days a lot or it's less? It's a lot, right? I mean, somebody, you're asking 60 days of somebody, somebody's time means a lot. So that's where you had those serious people coming in who are really interested in solving certain things. So you have those kind of people who came. You had startups that could apply. You had school students. You had college students. Anybody who could form a team could apply. And what we did was we gave them one lakh rupees in the first stage to solve or build the minimum valuable prototype. They're called MVPs, minimum viable prototypes. Right? So when you build these MVPs and you come to showcase what it does, and you have to come with a person with disability who you had solved the problem for. If you're solving muscular dystrophy, you have to bring the patient with muscular dystrophy, and your product had to prove to that person. So that is how it sort of really cleared out a lot of, like, you know, it removed the sort of so-called noise makers to real makers. Right? So this was another program. Hyperloop, how many of you have heard of the term Hyperloop? Can one of you quickly stand up and say what it means? Anybody? Or sit where you are and then just say what a Hyperloop is? I'll take a break from talking. Anybody? Just shout out. Go for it. You raise your hand. What's a Hyperloop? It's a brainchild of Elon Musk. Yes, that's right. So, Primarily what it is, is a bunch of capsules in a vacuum chamber traveling at the almost speed of sound, right? This is the brainchild of Elon Musk, which is also regarded as the fifth mode of transportation. What are the other four? Anyone? What are the four modes of transportation that exist today already? Sorry? Air, ships, trains, cars, yeah? Sort of. Road has both, uh, sort of land has both trains and cars, but then that's a very different format. So the fifth mode is Hyperloop. So it combines a lot of different parameters. Like, you know, it's like trying to give you the convenience of a car at the speed of the plane and at the capacity of a train. That's what Elon Musk puts it as, right? Now, if you look at it, how does a makerspace really support a concept that's so bloody crazy? Is Elon Musk normal? No? Yeah? How many of you think Elon Musk is normal? How many of you think he's abnormal? Or super terrestrial or not from this planet? But anyway, so if you look at it, Hyperloop became one of our pet projects because a bunch of students who got selected as the only Indian team, only other Asian team, the other one was Japan. Out of 24 teams that got selected to build a prototype and showcase it to Elon Musk, we were the only ones. So we built a pod, we fundraised for the pod, all of it in just two months. So it was exactly last year, June, July. We raised close to $150,000 in two months to build a pod and ship it to California and showcase it to Elon Musk with the painting that we gave of the Indian Mysore traditional style painting that we gave it to Elon Musk. So that is what we are talking about. This is what a makerspace can be, because you can make it to be that. A makerspace without a programming and a strong vision layer on top of it is just a garage. There's no difference from a makerspace that is a garage, which you can find in any corner of Haryana as well, I guess. Now, coming to sort of the crux 
of the talk. All of that was intro, right? Sorry for a longer intro, but then we worked our asses off to make that intro. So if you have to talk about real work, now these, this is when it gets interactive. I'm done exercising my jaw muscles for the day, now it's your time. What's the difference between creativity and innovation? Anyone, just shout out. Go for it. Okay. Fair enough. Any other? Yeah. Fair enough. Could could sort of fall into that bracket as well. Anybody has a different definition, or a different sort of difference? So all of that, right? I don't have to read out slides. It's for you to read. So we believe this is the difference between creativity and innovation. Now, is creativity important in your work? Is creativity important? Of course, we all know innovation is, because as you said, it brings out the practical points for applications as well. But is creativity important at work? Raise your hand if you think yes. Is creativity important for work? Yeah? So for those who are raising your hand, why do you say so? Just a point. Shout out. Go for it. So sort of if you had to bracket it under, it almost creates USPs. You all know what USP means? What's a USP? Sort of, right? Sort of falls into that bracket. Anybody has another point? Why is creativity important? No? Yeah? You have one? No? OK. Or why, for those who did not raise your hand of, of why creativity is not important, why did you say so? Why is creativity not important? Anybody? Raise your hand if you said it was not. Man. <laughs> Liars. Bunch of them did not raise your hand. Anyway. Now, do I know the answer? No. Right? Because not everything comes with a manual. So I don't know. Maybe, may not be. It depends on the kind of profession you are in. Right? But I believe, I personally believe that creativity is important wherever you are because at least it keeps your passion alive. It brings your perspective into things that generally might have skipped out. Now, Again, it's your journey. I'm sure you'll all find out and let me know. But this is why I believe that creativity is important for the generation that we are going into. Fair enough? All right. Now, on a general term, if we agree that maybe creativity is important in whatever we do in life, how do you be more creative? What are, what are the ways in which you can be more creative? There are some sort of mantras or shortcuts or tips, right? Well, we'll come to the disclaimer of the tips, but anyway. So primary essence of anything that you do in life, if you're not looking at the problem that you're trying to address, I think you've lost the plot. So that's what this really, really talks about to understand what you're trying to do and why you're trying to do from a problem statement point of view and from that creative angle to say, how are you addre addressing that problem? So this is where, like, you know, you can look at all of these. So the need for AI, the need for data analytics, the need for all of these things are in why you have to be more creative and how you can be more creative. So this is where it sort of falls into. What is ethnographic methods? You're all from the humanities. What's ethnographic? Come on, guys. Anyone? So, but what does ethnographic mean? So it's almost a mixture of ethnic and demographic, right? So if you take both of these things, you sort of get ethnographic in a larger sense. So that's something to look at. Now, 
why does perspectives matter? What does perspective mean? What is perspective? What's perspective? Have you all drawn? In drawing, what sort of views do you have? What's, what, what are the various views in drawing that you look at generally? If people know drawing. Top, front, side. What are those called generally? Perspectives. Why do you need perspectives? Right? And not everything is the same from all perspectives, right? So that is why perspective matters. Now, can you do this exercise? You've done it before? <laughs> anyway, so, right? So why perspectives are needed is because it gives you out of the box thinking. Because you can understand, you can empathize, you can sort of really know what somebody else is looking at. Why do they say the phrase, from my shoes, or have you put yourself in that person's shoes? Metaphorically, right? You don't have to wear that person's shoes. This is the point. Because you can get perspectives, you can get different understandings of the same problem, or the same issue, or the same solution that you're working on from various people. Now, another thing is you have to spend time learning about the world around you. Because the world as you see it is completely different from the world somebody else is going to look at. So these are some of the things that we are talking about will help you to be more creative and of course work in interdisciplinary teams. What does that mean? What is interdisciplinary? I know that your college is heavy on interdisciplinarity. What does it mean? I know that there needs no computer science intervention in a college where liberal arts and humanities are, but there is. Why? Why do you think a computer science department is relevant? Need all sorts of Similar, right? You have these sort of answers spanning across. It has, it, it's like a huge neural net. Everything is connected to everything. So that's where you're looking at multidisciplinary teams. Now, if you, how many of you have Apple products? Raise your hand if you have Apple products. Why do you choose Apple products versus other products which are more technically and technologically superior than Apple products? Why would you choose it? <laughs> okay. Why would somebody else choose, choose an Apple product over something else? Sorry? Brand. brand. What's the brand stand for? What does it stand for? Right? In various ways, they're more creative is what we believe compared to other peers that they have in the industry. Yes or no? We feel that they're more creative in nature. And if you are also leaning towards creativity, you'd want to be associated with that brand. Because it's sort of deeply, psychologically, in a very sort of behavioral science way, sort of makes you feel at home. Yes or no? OK, so, but Apple products were done by people who were multidisciplinary. If it was only engineers, trust me, it would have looked like an IBM. So just <laughs> saying. Right? Now, why do we have to work in creative environments? And where is the creative environment in your college? What would you call, in Ashoka University, a creative environment? Because you're all from this university. Is it your cafeteria? Is it center for entrepreneurship? Is it a computer science department? Is it your arts department? Is it the playground? I don't know. It could be anything. Whatever you make out of it and be creative there, I'm sure, is a creative environment. Again, spaces and places are not important. You are. So if you are creative and if you rub off that energy with your friends, I'm sure that's a creative space already. Yes or no? OK. Now, this is what I have to say to sort of end this part of this talk, which talks about 
what are you are you mindful of things or or are you mindful of things yeah make sense till now are you with me sort of okay now this is a break if you want to leave the room now this is a warning because next bit is going to be completely philosophical so until now it was more like fine he was okay but then now is going to be like all the heavy shit literally all all still with me you want to still brave this okay don't tell me i didn't warn you now how many of you know jugad what is jugad how many of you do jugad in college why do you do jugad in college what do you do okay who else does jugad do professors do jugad i'm sure you you do a bunch of jugad i mean you're an experimental physicist you do a bunch of jugad i'm sure who else does jugad ashish what is jugad you're all north indians i mean to so to say south indians don't even know jugad we call it different things but <laughs> sort of right it's a, it's a start it's the start towards being frugal frugally innovative jugad is largely sorry somebody said something jugad is la largely till today has been a makeshift solution yeah you can make do with it so some of the examples are this right the, i i chose these examples because serendipitously somebody mentioned low cost ac and somebody also and this is like this is why i say like in the universe conspires it's really conspiring the other thing is how many of you have tried this making maggi on a iron box <laughs> doesn't taste very well but <laughs> you sort of get what you want now this is another example okay when does jugad become innovation right that's a very interesting sort of transition like you can take any jugad that india has seen and india is jugadu like hell but then when can you take that jugad and make it into an innovation so we'll just watch a quick snippet of this ha ha wo bhi hai udhar hi rakh to aa jayega Coca Cola had an advertisement like this in Indonesia. Yeah, I know. This is a jugad. So we're trying to get the volume on to the speakers using another microphone near the speaker. Right? So jugad live. But anyway, so Coca Cola sort of did this campaign where they took all the street innovations that they saw where the barber using the coke bottle and sort of putting a top of the sprayer onto it and where they saw the roadside guy using it for a sauce mixture they saw it for somebody using it for a paint brush all of this was jugad and then coke just made it into a product and sold bottle tops so that you can reuse coke bottles in a responsible way now does that make coke really an awesome company by giving us still toilet cleaner maybe not right but something to be aware that you know people are looking at various kinds of things from a corporate level as well now this is another one you check the university of engineering and technology is about to open the application period for 2013 so they needed to call students attention
So I guess you get a glimpse of what students did with the support of the university and funded by the university for an advertisement board. So the university wanted more students, so they gave budget for advertisement. What did the students build? They gave the university an ad board, but along with it came a responsible solution. They used the humidity in the atmosphere to condense it into water for the desert region of Lima. Now, if you look at something like that, yes? So, if you want to go take a look at the documentary of this, there's a larger video of it. They have the tech, because this is open source as well, so you can find the entire tech described there. But simply put, it's just as way that the surrounding humidity and the air that's there, they say that it's 90% humid, just like if you go to Chennai, right? The water's there, so if you have a membrane that sort of really collects that humidity through just a simple heat exchanger, and then it trickles down the water into a reservoir, which then gives it out to a tap. So that's where something could have been made in a very interesting way rather than a mundane way. So that's where you're looking at something like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you look at China, they've built huge buildings that take the carbon in the atmosphere and then sort of condenses it. They say over time, they could really make diamonds out of that carbon. So there are research work happening in that direction as well. So many, many things happening. Now, this is a longer video. I will not play it. I'll just give you a glimpse of it for two minutes because we do not have time. So but then, this is a 20-minute video. If you can ever watch it, it's worth it. It basically talks about two important things in recent history of 50 years that has changed the world we are today. That's called as planned obsolescence and perceived obsolescence. So both of them largely talking about how designers in the 1950s who were gadget makers and people who used to build whatever, your products that you use today from cars to like, you know, radio sets to all of these things were given clear mandates from their corporate heads to build it to only last for up to six to one, months to one year. There were not, so because they wanted you to replace those products with their newer line of products, they wanted to keep the economy moving, they wanted you to keep buying. So that is where the entire talk talks about how designers even were trained in universities to build things that can be quickly tossed into the garbage so that you would go and buy something new. If you look at how the computer industry has also morphed itself, all of these things is where you will find huge design flaws and it was not built or designed to be like you know, holistic and understanding the entire ecosystem, but it was just built for doing its one purpose, and that one purpose when it got obsolete or when it got outdated, the only option you had is not to upgrade it, but just to dispose it. So that's where you sort of have an issue with that. And again, another video by Ted Ed is on ethics. How many of you know what is the biggest problem in self-driving self -driving cars? How many of you know there are self-driving cars? Yeah? All, you, all of you are living on the same rock as I am, the third rock from the sun? Okay. What is self-driving cars? What are they? Okay. I just saw that today there was a Twitter from Verge. Apple just patented a VR technology of, ki technology of killing zombies and doing in-flight and in in-car entertainment. That's their patent, to kill zombies wearing a headset while the autonomous car is driving. That's their entire patent. That's by Apple. 
right? And soon I'm sure I'll be buying it as well. Uh, who, who doesn't want to kill zombies? But what's the ethical dilemma of self-driving cars? How many of you have sort of heard of this point known as ethical dilemmas of self-driving cars? Go for it. You want to answer I, or we'll give him a chance? Yeah? Correct. Correct. Would you ever buy a car that kills you? If you have bought a self-driving car, would you buy a car that kills you? And the manual said that, sir, disclaimer, sir, if something is coming, then we will kill you and we will see who is coming. Would you buy a car that kills you? No, right? Would you buy a car that intentionally kills other people? That they will say, sir, if your car is going, then there are people, then people will kill you and you will do it later. So, would you buy a car that kills somebody? Like if somebody said that? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I mean, it depends. So that is the ethical dilemma. If a programmer of a self-driving car actually programs it to do it, it's called a premeditated murder. Right? Let's say, for example, this is the thought experiment, right? So you're on a highway. There's a truck that is going in front of you. A box falls from the truck, which is very heavy. And your car assesses that if you ram into the damn box, you're going to die. Now, to the left is a motorist without a helmet. To the right, maybe a goat. Which would you kill? And which would you be OK killing? Why? Is an animal's life lesser than yours? So anyway, usko baad mein biryani banayenge. I'm just saying, OK, what if it was a kid, one kid? Now? What if it is a car with highest safety standards? Let's assume you knew it. Your car knows it. Which would you crash into? So this is a real dilemma. In our ancient times, we used to call it Dharma Sankat. How many of you have this, heard this term, Dharma Sankat? What is, well, name one story of Dharma Sankat? No, we'll make it simpler. We'll still stick to animals because animals are easy to kill. So, how many of you have heard of the dove and the, and the eagle case? A dove goes fluttering, running for its life to the king, followed by an eagle. And the dove will say, oh king, save me. The eagle will say, kya kar rahe ho? Khane ko kyu le rahe ho? And the king has to decide between who should he let live and let die. If he kills the eagle, I'm sure another eagle will eat the dove. If he kills the dove and lets the eagle eat, what, what's the even point of going to a king to ask for justice? So this is what we've all heard and learned from nannies and grannies. But None of that matters in this era because we don't think it's applicable. But when you start looking at Dharma Sankats in tech is when you run back to your mythology. So that's where you're looking at something like this in ethics. So some of the things that I always sort of tell people who come to a makerspace as well is what is the ethical dilemma that you are facing or what is the ethical dilemma that you are trying to solve? So that's where you're sort of really pushing them to explore their boundaries as well. Now, these are some of the pointers for responsible work, right? Again, never take pointers or suggestions as prescriptive or as a Bible. They're only suggestive, they're only a framework for you to find your own sort of things. So I'm sure you can sort of go through this. I'll leave the presentation with Ashish as well if you're interested to sort of go through it. But this is what I would feel. Like, you know, if you're really working on anything, it could be anything. First of all, find a multidisciplinary team to work with. Then find these kind of problem statements that you can really drill down to and then solve them. But of course, all of this is fine, but just have fun in life as well, right? So that's what we are also talking about. That's the crux of the talk. Now, if you're interested 
I will tell you how a makerspace solves a lot of these issues or addresses a lot of these issues. Are we still with, are you still with me? You want to see why a makerspace is relevant to solving problems? Ashish, should we? Should we try? Okay, so if you really look at why DIY skilling becomes a very important thing going forward is how many of you, and no offense to university, but then how many of you feel that university really provides learning, knowledge? Does the university provide it, or do you make that happen for yourself? Yes, you had a... Sure, but then... Fair enough, but here's also the other thing, right? If you look at universities in general, they're again supposed to be like a makerspace itself. We were just talking about it yesterday. A university itself is supposed to be a makerspace. It is making you, it is making you into a better product, if you're a product. If you don't want to be called that, if you're a human being, that's fine. But a university is supposed to make something out of you. It's a makerspace in itself, and it has departments and people, just like how a makerspace would have tools, machines, mentors, network, resources, all of these things coming together to support what you would like to do. So that is where, like, you know, if you really look at how a makerspace really adds value, it is just another place with many, many things that facilitates your sort of potential there. Now, if you look at it, as I said earlier, if you're looking at a biophysical sort of an era that we are entering into where everything is going to be connected with everything from a biological perspective as well, right? You know, nanotechnology and then all of these technologies that are on the forefront of doing many, many things. There have been a recent sort of uh, study where they are already printing fully functional livers in a 3D printing facility. How many of you have seen 3D printers in, in, in action? How many of you have seen jalebi making in action? Isn't it very close to each other? But bloody Indians forgot to put a machine onto the jalebi making thing to make it a 3D printer. And we lost the game there. Right? That's what we are talking about. We had context, we had information, we had inspiration. We were just bumps on the saddle. Now. If you really look at why the reasons for DIY skilling, because I, okay. I believe that learning happens by one's own passion for learning, not because somebody is telling you to learn. Do you believe that or no? Would you learn because somebody is saying or would you learn because you want to learn? What's, the, what's it? Raise your hand if you feel that you're learning because somebody else told you to learn and teaching you to learn. Raise your hand if you believe you're learning because you want to learn. Right? So you're looking at these kind of things where if there is convergence happening, there's singularity being approached. A makerspace is already an attempt at it. I have people working in biotechnology building mycelium-based material for modern manufacturing. They are looking at making furniture out of mycelium. How many of you know what mycelium is? It's the root of mushroom. And mycelium is a super material. You can make leather out of it, you can make furniture out of it, based on how you can grow it. It's a huge mass that grows underneath the mushroom, underground. And you can cultivate it in various ways. My collaborators in Barcelona, they laser cut a bunch of models for a chair, exactly like this on a laser cutter, with a backrest, with the uh, ass rest, and the legs, right? And then it's all just in, like, you know, blocks. What they did was they just put a little bit of soil, they put mycelium all around, and then just kept it for a bunch of days. It grew into a chair, and then you could just take a saw, and then just cut off the parts that you did not want and it stays like that forever, if you do a little bit of treatment to it, right? This is some of the amazing things. Now imagine, that was a physical living thing.
Now, if you put a bunch of sensors into it to analyze your heartbeat, your sort of vitals, your like you know sweat, your other things, what does it become? And it goes to the cloud and you get data saying that you're sweating your ass off, you need to take a walk. The mushroom will talk to you. Right? Now, some of the technologies that you can expect at a makerspace that will help you fast track these kind of innovation, fast track these kind of work that you want to do. We're just going to sort of, since we have not much time, we will sort of, I'll just introduce those technologies in a very simple way because most of you seem to know what it is, right? One is 3D printing. I used to work for the company in the US that invented 3D printing called as 3D systems. I've worked on some cutting edge technology with metals, with photopolymers, with various kinds of things. But unfortunately, as a startup entrepreneur, I can only afford something called as an FDM technology that's exactly like jalebi making. It's called fused deposition modeling. It's a, a filament that goes into a hot end, which is like an extruder, and then that just blurts out a bunch of gooey material. And you, depending on the movement, it sort of builds up. It's, 3D printing is nothing but 2D printing over and over again in different perspectives. Yeah? If you want to watch a video, I can play that, but it would be more fun to play with one, maybe soon. Yeah? So I think since lack of time, we'll move on to the next one. The other one is desktop forming, which is catching up very quickly. What is desktop forming? I think you just watch it, it's easy. That's a vacuum cleaner. This is just polymers. Make your design and place it on the bed. That's a potato. Form box molds a 3D shape in seconds. Take it out and start a production line right from your tabletop. So you can bring your first collection of products to life. So that's how desktop forming works. You have a mold on which if you put a heated polymer and you press it down, it takes the shape of the mold. And there are very expensive machines in the industry to make this happen. But then, this can be got into a makerspace for under $3,000, right? And that can allow you to mass produce many, many things. So let's say, for example, you've created something for a local vendor or a local, like, you know, a cart guy, a guy who sells Taylor food, right? If you want to create something for that person, which is something more sensible, like how the other examples were given, you can literally do that using this machine. You can mass produce some of these things. And again, if you're interested in the cross section of looking at multi-materials, maybe something like mycelium would excite you to do some research on some biodegradable plastics or biodegradable. There are people who are making edible plates. Right? So these are all people who could use a machine like this, which is forming, because a plate is generally formed. There's a mold, and then the plate material, and then you form it. So this is a machine that sort of really helps fast-tracking a lot of things. Uh, how many of you have heard of this? Aquaponics and hydroponics are changing the way you look at agri-tech. And then this was in Brooklyn in a shipping container. People can generate food that is required for an entire restaurant in just a shipping container. Right? So you're looking at things like these changes the way, and this is all doable by all of us. Right? You don't need a shipping container. Even if you have a terrace, that's more than enough to do something. But then you can use technology, or even if you have a room, because all of this is grown indoors. There's a particular type of UV light that you adjust any norm, normal RGB LED strips so that it will grow well. And then there have been studies, at least in my makerspace, there's a researcher from biotechnology who's looking at how can you play different musical notes and frequencies that will help plant grow better. Because if you feel that everything has a sense for vibration, then obviously if you look at light, as a particular frequency, 
and even sound is a particular frequency that allows or accentuates growth. Right? So there are research work happening in multi dimensions uh, for things like these. And then, of course, there is something called as microcontrollers and microcomputers and all of these kind of things. Raspberry Pi happens to be one of the more powerful engines there, which can power up a lot of things. That entire sort of shipping container could be powered by one Raspberry Pi that could just control everything there. It's just a mini computer, right? So things like these are really, really changing the way we prototype, changing the way we work, changing the way we present it to the world. Anything can be made possible through shorter bursts of sort of trying and innovation. So that is what a makerspace really, really sort of puts across in a very interesting way. Jugard is sort of the DNA of makerspaces because you're trying to make do with a lot of resources that are not there with you, right? Spaces like mine, which is self-funded, it's very hard to buy all the machines but we still make do with what we can. We build our own machines sometimes. And apart from that, this is literally what I would want to sort of leave you with today. Like you need to identify who you are. Are you an innovator? Are you a maker? Are you a technologist? Are you a policy maker? Are you an educationist? Are you a researcher? What are you? And again, if there are two things that emerge, and you are both at the same time. Like, I have a TED talk if you want to listen to it, where I talk about how people can be multidisciplinary in nature. I'm a sports person and I'm an engineer. So be it. I follow both of them religiously. And you could be a musician and you could be an engineer or you could be a doctor, right? Is it, is it not possible in today's world? It's possible. You can be many things at the same time. I know doctors who are theater artists who do fantastic at both their jobs. I know uh, people who are policy makers and who are carpenters. So you can be multiple or singular, anything is possible. So that's what you need to find out who really are you. And that's pretty much it about what we do. <laughs>